Welcome to History Talk, the podcast that brings together a panel of experts to discuss current events and historical perspective. I'm your host, Brenda Miller. And I'm your other host, Jessica Venus Nelson. In the last few years, controversies have exploded on college campuses. From protests over alt-right speakers to the Me Too movement and sexual assault on campuses and campus corporate partnerships, students have engaged in a host of politically charged issues in recent years. Last year, protests erupted on campuses over President Trump's inauguration and the Muslim travel ban, and protests at Berkeley and the University of Washington turned violent after controversial political commentator Milo Yiannopoulos was invited to speak on campus. Since then, other schools have had battles over controversial speakers, too, and recently Kent State officials barred an invitation for white supremacist Richard Spencer to speak on the anniversary of the 1970 Kent State school shooting. But from Kent State to Berkeley to our very own Ohio State University, activism on college campuses is nothing new. How do campus protests break out? To what extent can campuses serve as launching points for social change? And how can learning about past campus protests help us navigate on-campus controversies today? Today, we have two guests with us to discuss the past and present of politics and protests on college campuses. In the studio with us, we have Bill Security, Ohio State University, former Vice President for Business and Finance and author of The Ohio State University in the 60s, The Unraveling of the Old Order. Hello. Glad to be here. And also here with us is Dr. David Steigerwald, a professor of history at The Ohio State University, where he focuses on 20th century American history, particularly the Vietnam War and the 60s. Hi there. Thanks for joining us today. When most people think about the history of campus protests, they think about the 1960s. Is that when campus protests originated, or do they have a longer history? They have a longer history, as most things do. You can go, in the American experience, uh, well back into the early 19th century. Um, Harvard, for one, was known to be a place where, believe it or not, students were um, bumptious and aggressive. So... um, The campus has has always had a reputation of being somewhat unsettled. Um, We can see college campus protests in uh, the World War I era um, uh, through the 30s. Um, I mean, for example, the the Northeastern schools during the 30s were really quite riven with uh, left-wing protests. I mean, City College in New York is famous for the the fights, both food fights and and, uh, outright uh, bare-knuckled brawls between the Trots and the Stalinists uh, with the other left-wingers just kind of standing in the the corners watching. So uh, it wasn't unique to the 60s that student protests erupted. Uh, But uh, they they probably never did in quite the same size and scope and notoriety as in the 60s. Yeah, and in fact, speaking of Ohio State, being in the Midwest, they were a little more genteel than some of the uh, uh, places that David just mentioned. But, in fact, during the 30s, there were some big protests here at Ohio State against compulsory military training, or what we now know as ROTC. Um, But it really took on a whole different momentum and scope in the 1960s. So with such a pronounced history of campus protests and student activism, then is there a particular reason why these sorts of issues coalesce on college campuses? I think it's a combination of things. First of all, Universities in this country and and in at least many parts of the free world consider themselves places where new ideas are welcome, debate is welcome, discussion is welcome, activism is encouraged. And then when you get a bunch of of young people together who believe in things and want to learn and want to express themselves, you have the ingredients that can lead to a lot of activist behavior. Yeah, I agree with that. One of the Comparative things to be said about American universities, however, is that they've never been legally um, or institutionally independent to the same extent that they Mm. are in places like France and in the Spanish-speaking world where campuses really are supposed to be autonomous Mm. or they often are. So to some extent, American campuses are structurally not so well suited as they might be to um, autonomous politics and protest. Or maybe that's the reason why there's more. Yeah. Well, so what were the most significant campus protests of the 1960s, and what were they about? Big part of it was civil rights, particularly regarding the treatment of African Americans, both on campus and countrywide. 
A second package is around the military, and that would involve both compulsory military training, or ROTC. It also involved military recruiting on campus. It involved the draft, and as the decade went on, it involved protests against the Vietnam War. Uh, the third group in, involved the issue of free speech, who was allowed on campus, who was not allowed, why, and what happened. A fourth bundle of issues involved the uh, treatment of dissenters, and that became more and more important as the big crackdown occurred in the later part of the 60s. And the fifth were kind of a, a mixed bag of unpredictable things. Here there was a big protest against the decision by the faculty council not to go to the Rose Bowl. There was also a, a protest that flared up over an arrest over a jaywalking ticket. And there was a protest, believe it or not, over a, the administration's handling of a change in the leadership at the Lantern. So it's all kinds of different things. And protest was in the air in the 60s, and it definitely was felt here. So the real tricky question is, why was it in the air? Mm -hmm. And the answer to that rests in the social and cultural and, to some extent, intellectual history of uh, post-war America into the 50s and then bleeding into the 60s. There were cultural and social underpinnings of uh, middle-class white Americans' lives, that that population that was bound to go to the university, that conduced to certain kinds of interpretations of the, uh, of the environment around them. I'm thinking particularly about the growth of a regimented life in an increasingly bureaucratized society, a suburbanized homogeneity that bred a kind of sense of uh, loneliness and and conformity, and along with conformity, the, the other side of the coin of conformity, according to the social scientists, was always apathy. A kind of deadened world uh, encased around young people who were going into the college in the early 60s. And the sensitive and the idealistic and the well-read among them understood that this world that they were asked to inherit in those famous words of the Port Huron Statement the statement of the Students for Democratic Society was um, really a stifling one. And so when the issues that Bill just so nicely summed up presented themselves, there was a certain part of that particular generation that was primed already to question, but not just question, but to act against. Let me build on that because the generational <laughs> aspect of the protests in the 60s is extremely important. So this is the generation of people born right after World War II who became college age in the mid-60s. And they were born and raised in a period of tremendous material prosperity, even middle-class kids. But there was an enormous contradiction. Their parents have since been called the greatest generation, and in some ways justifiably so. But as these students grew older and recognized what was going on around them, they saw an enormous amount of hypocrisy in what was going on in society. So that even though society was materially well off, there was a corruption of spirit going on. It was great for white male Americans, but in fact women were held back, black and brown people were held back, uh, there were rules that had to be followed that favored one group over another. And as this group became older and more aware, they felt that they should do something about it. I want to respond to that, if I may. Bill has laid out, a, um, a, I think, a, a, a sincere and yet overly flattering <laughs> uh, view of what was motivating the protests of the 60s. And I, I don't mean to be critical in these remarks, but there were personal experiences rather than a reaction to these hypocrisies and injustices that were around them that had primed the early activists and even mid and, and maybe even more so the late 60s activists to engage in the things they engaged in. And I really want to insist on the structural paradoxes of the world that they grew up in. The post-war order was one of the most widely shared affluence uh, that any human society had ever created. But that affluence was created um, through institutions that were themselves pretty stifling. It was a bu increasingly bureaucratized, incorporated, mass-produced world 
that really denied easy access to creativity, that encouraged autonomy, and that was the one of the big catchwords, as you mm-hmm. remember, mm-hmm. of the 60s uh, rebels, autonomy and authenticity. The world that they were reacting against was one uh, one that they believed that many of them understood as having denied them personally uh, the control over their lives that they thought human beings should have. This well, it seems to me to to sort of precede both temporally, but I'm thinking more psychologically, their concerns about the institutionalized injustices that American society obviously had. When it became impossible to ignore those injustices, and as you've noted already, mm-hmm. it was especially the civil rights movement mm-hmm. that opened eyes, um, they could easily understand things like the civil rights movement through that prism of alienation. And I guess I, I don't disagree totally. And alienation was a big part of it for a lot of different reasons. But when we talk about they or them, when we talk about college students in the 60s, it's a pretty wide and diverse group of people and opinions that was also going on. You had conservative students, you had liberal students. But every now and then something would happen that would pull many people together in a way in the 60s that was very unique and has not since been repeated. Can you explain a couple of specific protests that particularly stand out and that were memorable? Why don't I take Berkeley, Bill, and you okay. have Ohio mm-hmm. State? Sure. Berkeley was was home to a growing base of activists as early as the late 50s. There was a famous confrontation between Berkeley students and San Francisco police in 1960 where they, they had gone over across the bay to protest the House Un-American Activities Committee holding hearings on subversion in California. <laughs> and the San Francisco police just assaulted them on the front steps of City Hall. And that actually was the first altercation between college activists and the authorities, the law and order crowd in all of the 60s. So it, it was already a kind of hotbed of dissent when in 1963 and then even more in 64, a critical mass of Berkeley students went to help register voters in Mississippi along with the Committee on, on uh, Freedom Organizations and, and the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. And they went back home to, to school, both enlivened and, and inspired by what they had done. At the beginning of fall term in 1964, the authorities on, on campus decided to shut down a strip of sidewalk that since the 1930s had been relegated for student political activity, organizing activities, tables to hand out leaflets, uh, soapbox speakers, and so forth. And so they shut it down, and you had this this group of students, a wide variety of students that included students for Goldwater. So uh, that was the beginning of the free speech movement. It uh, immediately elicited a, an occupation of the administration building. They were wrenched out of the building. Uh, Berkeley police surrounded, came, well, came to campus and um, just showed a, a presence. At that moment, a graduate student, or maybe he'd already dropped out of school, he was one of those campus hangers about a guy named Jack Weinberg who got in an altercation, a scuffle with a couple of, of Berkeley patrolmen who promptly arrested him and threw him in the back of the car. Um, several students who were around saw this happen, and they surrounded the car. More students came. Suddenly the few turned into dozens, and the dozens turned into a hundred. And taking shifts over the course of about two days, uh, Berkeley students kept the two, the two policemen and Weinberg captive. So they were using the squad car for, as a podium for speeches, one of which included the soon-to-be-famous um, leader of the free speech movement, Mario Savio. This um, moved into the, the full fall term. The university took action against the leaders of the free speech movement, including expelling Savio and a handful of others, uh, and that only emboldened more student activism. This ran its course into December, the end of the term, where there was another very large-scale occupation of Sproul Hall, at that moment, Mario Savio gave, gave a, a, one of the most famous speeches of the decade, his uh, you've got to throw your body against the machine, against the levers of power speech, and the, the university relented somewhat. They kept him expelled for the time being. But going into the next term and wanting to quiet the campus, the administration capitulated across the board, and free speech movement uh, didn't exactly peter out, but 
it certainly lost its edge because the university had more or less given them what they were asking for. So this occurred in uh, California in December of 1964. The whole the fall of 64. Yeah, fall of 64, early part of 65. Now it's the spring of 1965, just a couple months later at OSU. You had some political activism and protests prior to that, but nothing to the degree uh, Berkeley had had. But you had a group of students at OSU, including a gentleman by the name of Jeff Schwartz, who had done um, uh, registering black voters in Louisiana over Freedom Summer. And he and uh, a couple of other colleagues wanted to do something about the university had something called the speaker's rule, which said the president could ban a speaker from campus if the president thought that speaker was subversive. So they developed uh, the free speech front, which was similar deliberately to the name free speech movement in Berkeley. And in fact, uh, in April, they made a series of demands to the administration, although the rallies were very peaceful, and they actually did an occupation of the administration building. But I interviewed Jeff Schwartz for my book, and he said one of the things is that he understood Columbus, Ohio, was not California. And he was afraid that if if the protesters didn't conduct themselves properly, the Columbus Dispatch, which was very conservative, and other elements of campus would use that as a distraction away from the issue. He and the other leaders of the free speech front here in Columbus told their students when they came in to sit in the administration building to wear coats and ties, to behave themselves. And so they did a sit-in for about a day, and then they decided to leave, and they cleaned up after themselves. Still, the administration didn't do anything. So they came back a second day and stayed in the administration building after it closed. Now, at Berkeley, that was the flashpoint of the, co- the confrontation because that's when the police came in to try and forcibly drag students out of the building. So the question is, what is the OSU administration going to do? So the students sat in overnight. The administration watched, but they didn't do anything. So it was very different than what Berkeley did. So they did continue peaceful protests. Nothing happened over the spring, but over the summer, um, a lot of machinations went on behind the scenes. And when school came, school started in the fall, the Board of Trustees met and on the president's recommendation changed the speaker's rule to uh, essentially allow any speaker other than someone who advocated directly violence on campus and it settled the issue. So the issue got settled at Ohio State without one student being arrested, one penny of property damage. What was not known at the time but found out behind the scenes, in California, the person who pushed the administration to clear out the students out of the administration building was the liberal Democratic governor, Pat Brown. In Ohio, you had a Republican, somewhat conservative governor, Jim Rhodes, who essentially kept his hands off what the administration did, but behind the scenes we now know to get a resolution of this issue without Ohio State turning into a Berkeley because he wanted to sell the wonderful world of Ohio as a place for businesses to locate and felt if we had a big eruption like they did at Berkeley, it would hurt. Now, five years later, Governor Rhodes was involved in the lead up to the Kent State incidents and shootings. But it's kind of interesting that Ohio State had the next biggest protest after Berkeley but it had a very different outcome because there was restraint on both sides. Now, you would have thought people would have learned from that, but instead, as the decade went on, the desire to confront became greater and greater. What's interesting about both those cases is not just that they were both free speech protests, but that they were both really localized eruptions having to do very specifically with very specific conditions in very specific places, right? But we both know um, that... Once the war got rolling, then uh, campuses across the country began to to witness and be scenes of student protest. And so at that point, those issues were not quite so localized. So how did the issues today about free speech compare to the issues then? Well, it's kind of interesting. I, you know, then it was the barring of so-called subversives, which were generally left-wing or communist speakers. The controversy today seems to be over um, uh, white nationalists and some of the ultra, ultra, ultra right people and the fact that it isn't what they say, it's all the violence that accompanies them. Maybe it is part of what they say. There's a part of me that says 
um, a university needs to be open to different voices. And in some ways, you build these people up by banning them. It's better to let them talk and people to hear how silly they are. On the other hand, as someone who, when I was uh, still working, was ultimately responsible next to the president for university security, you worry about people like that coming on campus and inflaming things, and then somebody gets seriously injured or killed, and then you ask yourself, is there something I could have done to stop it? I'm largely with Bill yeah. on this. If Richard Spencer wants to sit out on the sidewalk at 15th and, and High, have at it, because I believe free speech is really important. I, I'm still uh, of the view, though, that the university community has a right to control who speaks on campus. The big difference here between what, what we're talking about in the 60s, the free speech rule particularly in the 60s in Ohio State, was that the president had the right to ban people whom students invited, that uh, uh, endorsed student groups couldn't invite whomever they wanted. And that's not what's happening here. Nobody from Ohio State invited Richard Spencer to come here. And no one invited him from uh, Kent State student groups. Nobody invited him from the University of uh, Cincinnati student groups. He's got some lawyer from Michigan who's going around the country threatening suits if universities don't open their facilities to them. And that's a very different thing. I, I see no reason why the university should be compelled to open their facilities to anybody who's got an aggressive lawyer. So how do these protests morph into anti-war protests? Well, because the war grew in terms of its impact on society. So at the beginning of the 60s, there's only a few advisors. Uh, by the middle of the 60s, it started to be ground troops. The military had to switch, put more emphasis on the draft. As long as you stayed in college, you could get an exemption to stay out of the draft. There was still a lot of anti-war sentiment and the protests against the draft and the military went on at the same time. The interesting thing about Ohio State is you had anti-war protests here. They started in the fall of 65 with two people and grew some as the decade went on. You also had the country's largest ROTC detachment. They had people both who fought the war and fought against the war here on the campus at the same time. I want to take the war back to my comments about the cultural and social underpinnings of student activism. One of the great theoretical and organizing challenges that the new left had for itself was, why are we being radical? After all, we're not really being oppressed. So the new left had to figure out whether they were being radical for other people, such as African Americans, or whether there was something really more serious that was generating their activism. The war gave them that reason. And it wasn't just the war was immoral. It was now they're coming to get us. And so the war personalized government intrusion into lives and, I think you could argue, oppression. After all, what is a, a more severe intrusion by the state into an individual life than conscription into the armed services? And that actually was borne out in the way they – in a lot of the rhetoric of the protests. Not with my life you don't was one of the SDS rallying cries. But I think the war as it grew and as the draft became more prominent was really the catalyst to bringing together those somewhat diffuse personal concerns and the cultural backgrounds as well as the theoretical challenge of why we are political. It is to a point, and there was a great phrase because then 18-year-olds couldn't vote, so the line was old enough to kill but not for voting. That also energized students. But the campus, particularly the OSU campus, and I was here at the time, was oddly in some ways insulated from that because it could, if, if you wanted to stay out of the draft, all you had to do was stay in school, and then after your four years were over, go on to graduate school or law school or whatever, and then you'd be too old to be drafted. So in some ways, the campus was protected, and the anti-war movement here was had a great deal of difficulty getting any traction among the majority of students, and they got increasingly frustrated. And then in February of 1968, the country changed the draft laws and abolished deferments for graduate students. That all of a sudden made the war much more personal. So now this starts to build as the decade goes on, and protests which had been peaceful start to turn violent. And you had the big one in Columbia where the students actually took over the administration building and then had to be hauled out by force. And with television and radio and mass media, everybody's now seeing that, and it's in the air. Columbia was one of the big ones. Yeah. Uh, the University of Wisconsin saw yeah, yeah. 
protests in 66 and 67, yeah. as well as the, the notorious yeah. bombing in 1969, yeah. which uh, was carried out. I mean, the perpetrators of that were were not students. They were locals, kind of yeah. hangers on to the local radical student yeah. movement. The, the war's escalation provided at yeah. least the kind of tenor mm-hmm. and tone in American life uh, against which the, the largest and, mm-hmm. and most uh, fractious of the campus protests. Mm-hmm. And that's a good point. The war became a combination of the war itself as it escalated. Uh, there was also a lot of unrest in the black community because after the Civil Rights Act, I think people expected things to be better, and they weren't. And there was also a rising tide of crime. So you had in some people's mind on the left the circle of violence that started with government-sanctioned violence in Vietnam and then police and law enforcement violence against protesters at home on one side. On the other side, you had Mr. and Mrs. Average America who looked at this and said, no, it's the protesters creating the violence, and they're disrespectful of America, and they're threatening our way of life. So all of a sudden now the country is very much divided and a real sense that the country is coming apart. So what happens at Kent State? When I think of this period, I think of the term blowback. So you had more aggressive protests on campus as students became more and more upset against the war, which in turn led then to a a reaction from the people Richard Nixon called the silent majority, Uh, the average Americans who didn't necessarily live in a big city and and who may have qualms about the war but didn't approve the way uh, war protesters were acting. So you had a real appeal to what was called law and order. In fact, that's how Richard Nixon got elected in 1968. By this time, then, the, the protests are escalating, but President Nixon had gotten elected promising to bring an honorable end to the war, although he wasn't very specific about it. Beginning in mid-1969, in fact, he did start to withdraw troops from Vietnam. But at that point, President Nixon authorized what he called an incursion, not an invasion. It meant they were temporarily send troops across the border in Cambodia to go after enemy sanctuaries. Well, that looked like a widening of the war, and that set off a whole series of uh, anti-war protests. And among the places where there were some protests was in Kent, Ohio, and some students were protesting war. Some other students were out on in bars on Friday night, and they trashed the downtown. Governor Rhodes, whose term was ending, was running for the Republican nomination for Senate. He then showed up in Cleveland and held a press conference that Sunday after the students and non-students had done some damage. They'd burned down the ROTC building on the Kent campus and made a very inflammatory speech. And he ordered martial law on the campus without consulting with the campus president and ordered the National Guard to restore order. Uh, There was a peaceful protest scheduled for that Monday. That would be Monday, May 4th. At about noon, students did gather. The National Guard told them that the protest was unlawful under those conditions and wanted them to move. The students didn't move. There was some back and forth. And then for reasons that have never clearly been determined, the National Guardsmen, who had loaded rifles, turned and fired on a crowd of unarmed students, killing four of them, wounding 13 Uh, No, wounding nine, I think, Uh, one of them seriously, and it was just a horrible scene. What a lot of people don't realize, there were also serious protests and confrontation here at Ohio, but they occurred before the Kent State events, and that was more a reaction against an overreaction by the police with tear gas against a student strike, which had been called against the war and against uh, a, a variety of other things. But it was a very divisive period, a very dark period in American history. We've spent uh, mm-hmm. probably eight years or more just talking back and forth mm-hmm. about exactly what happened at Kent State and to figure out, among other things, why the guard shot at Kent State and not at Ohio State. Uh, and Bill found the answer. So it was guard protocol that uh, they did crowd control with lime, live ammunition. I mean, is that stupid or what? But in any event, this particular guy named Abramson had his men uh, with loaded rifles, but he told them not to up, uh, put the it's bullet. chambering around. Yeah, he didn't it. chamber the rounds. But uh, the leadership, the officers at Kent had their guys uh, be ready to shoot. And so it really boils down to a momentary fog of war kind of thing where the failure of, of decent leadership at Kent State cost lives. Since the protests of the 1960s, 
Um, what have college protests been like in the interim to today? Have there been other notable protests? Have they changed? Nothing of the size and scope. And I, I got to say, historic importance. They've been intermittent. They've been episodic. They've been sporadic. One thinks of the anti-apartheid boycott South Africa campus protests in the uh, 70s and 80s um, and protests at places in the 90s over the curriculum of all things. Mm-hmm. And they just never had the real weight of what was happening in the 60s, I think. Yeah, and I think there are a couple, there's both good reasons and bad reasons. The good reasons mm-hmm. are there's some reforms that came out of the 60s that took some of the steam out of that, the giving 18-year-olds the vote, the end of the draft, the move to an all-volunteer military. A big one was a change in the way police and law enforcement handled big crowds. So they went more to community policing, so the police weren't, in most cases, weren't the provocation. Those were good things that removed some of the reasons that protests occurred. Uh, You wonder, though, I mean, there are a lot of things with society that are wrong and need to be improved, but students seem more concerned with themselves than they do with the collective good of the country. In fact, the whole country seems that way (laughs) right now. So I want to say something different. To some extent, college in the 1960s was a luxury. Today, it is anything but. It's a debt trap. And a debt trap for students whose economic security after college is anything but assured as it was for, for the bulk of college graduates in the 1960s. So our students today are simply in a much more precarious position than their parents were in the 60s. However, I remain frustrated with them that in that they really do have material demands and collective self-interest that they ought to be pushing very hard against their political leaders and representatives, and I remain frustrated that they don't do that. I think that there should be a nationwide student movement to bring down tuition. I think there should be a, station, a, a nationwide student movement to protest the cuts in higher education that have been drastic in state after state, including Ohio, over the last 20 years. And I'm disheartened at the quiescence that I see. But he's right. There was, in the spring of 1970, a lot of people don't realize this, there was a march that OSU people helped organize down to the state house to protest high tuition because of <laughs> low state support. And it was very peaceful, and the legislature ignored it. Are college protests effective, then? Are they still effective tools, and have they ever been? Are they appropriate places to launch serious demands against the social system? Let me say yes and no on that one. I think they helped shorten the Vietnam War. I thought they helped bring an end to the draft. I thought they were a basis for the environmental movement, uh, and I thought they helped remove a lot of restrictions on black people and also opened up doors to women and other people who had been discriminated against. But it came at a price, and the price was... Uh, for that small element of the protesters who we would call the crazies, the people that wanted to deliberately provoke a confrontation, it created a blowback that took away some of what the gains that already had been occurred and turned middle America against protesters in some way and made it easier for the politicians who didn't want to do those things to come out against them in the name of law and order. So I want to think about this as a political theorist. And the question really is whether university campuses are so essential to the functioning of contemporary America that a disruption in them would disrupt the system. And my answer is sort of like Bill's yes and no. I don't think that campuses, that universities are really great places from which to launch serious social movements, in part because... So many fellow Americans um, don't think that college students are serious about these kinds of things, or if they if they do start to get disruptive, it's just those kids again. And this is a clear result of the division in American society that Bill's illustrated here. But there's also something, I think, functional about the universities, that they aren't necessarily institutions that are, that are central to the day-to-day governance of American society, A, nor are they completely essential to the functioning of the economic system. In indirect ways and uh, roundabout fashion, they are because 
the economy, uh, the supposedly knowledge, high-tech economy relies obviously on college-educated people. But the institutions themselves, I'm not convinced, are essential. And I, I just ask you, I mean, uh, if we all organized a sit-in at Ohio State and all 55,000 or 75,000 of us sat down for 44 days, what would change? Compare that to the sit-down strike in the GM uh, factories in Flint in the 1930s, 37, and remind yourself how disruptive those point of production uh, protests were. So th- there's become something abstract and diffuse, even opaque, about the way power functions in our high-tech world that makes it really hard to pinpoint the place out of which a really effective revolutionary movement can be launched. The the 60s had the effect of broadening the inclusion of we on campus, but the frustrating thing is that it stands for campus more than American society mm-hmm. in at least the medium run. Maybe mm-hmm. in the long run, America is learning to widen the circle as well. There's both a kind of insularity in those changes and nonetheless a, a broadening as well. So to a certain extent, campuses still struggle with the problem of these being ivory tower issues, but they can have so. broader effects. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's, that's my sense of things. On campuses as change agents, to me one of the most fascinating stories out of the 60s was all that ruckus to get 18-year-olds to vote. There were a group of OSU students then who started a campaign called Register Here in the summer of 1970. The first municipal election to be held that 18-year-olds could vote in in this area was the mayor's race here in Columbus. And the previous mayor, who was a Democrat, had won big time in 1967. He was up for re-election. When the results came in election night, he was narrowly defeated by a Republican opponent, Mayor Tom Moody. And when they checked the election results, they found out that the number of voters had swelled in two areas, in the black community and in the campus community, both of which had felt the the short end of the stick from Columbus police. So it flipped the election. Once that happened, it started to change the attitude of the city of Columbus and the university towards each other to become a much more supportive relationship. And the Columbus police today are very different from the Columbus police of 1970 and are much more community-oriented and supportive of the students, as are the campus police. And that traces back, I think, to that student activism. So when students organize and exercise their traditional ways of exercising power, which includes voting, they can make a difference. All right, we'll wrap it up on that note. Thank you to our two guests, Bill Shakurdi and Dave Steigerwald. Thanks, everyone. This episode of History Talk Podcast was brought to you by Origins, Current Events and Historical Perspective, an online publication of the Public History Initiative and the Goldberg Center in the History Department at the E. Ohio State University in Columbus and Miami University in Oxford, Ohio. Our main editors are Stephen Kahn and Nicholas Breivogel. Our audio and technical advisor is Paul Kotheimer. Our audio producers and hosts are Brenna Miller and Jessica Venus Nelson. Song and band information can be found on our website. You can find our podcasts and more on our website, origins.osu.edu, on iTunes and on SoundCloud and Stitcher. And as always, you can find us on Twitter and Facebook. Thanks for listening.